Hello, I'm Dr. Natalie Levy, and I'm a clinical psychologist working at the Integrated Psychology Clinic in London, where we um, have seen a lot of patients with EDS and HSD um, over the years. And um, this talk is really just to try to help you with any difficult conversations that you will end up having in areas of your life, um, either with health professionals or with um, your personal life with family and friends. And um, I've really tried to make this talk practical with some useful ideas and gleaned from just the conversations I've had, the um, experiences I've had with my patients. So some of these tips come from other EDS and HSD patients. Um, and we'll be talking about the common sort of themes that, that tend to come up for people. So my talk, I've tried to keep it simple today, um, just focusing on the really key themes. Um, and I've divided this into, first of all, thinking about some of the common experiences in conversations with others who, who don't understand HSD D and EDS and just don't get it properly um, and the kind of common things that come up and it'd be interesting maybe when, as you're watching this talk just to think if any of that resonates with you um, and then there's been some really interesting research on clinician associated traumatization um, which I think is really relevant here I think many of our patients describe traumatizing and very stressful experiences over the years with health professionals who, who just don't get their condition. And I'll be talking a bit more about the psychological impact of that. And then finally, some practical ideas when you're having conversations with either health professionals or people at work, family, friends, and you may already have lots of your own great tips. So these are just designed to just think through with it, whether there's anything else that you might want to um, be trying out. So these are unfortunately some of the things which our patients say to us about um, things that happen in conversations for them. Um, so you've probably all heard at some point it's in your head, it's psychological, you're just stressed, which is so unhelpful and inaccurate. Everything happens in our brain, in our head, um, for all of us, our physical movements, everything. Um, and pain is processed in the brain, of course. But often when health professionals say those kind of words, what they're trying to infer is it's it's your fault somehow. And that's what patients take away from it. And it can be really, really stressful and upsetting. Um, what we always say to patients is, of course, there are psychological impacts of your health condition, you know, being in chronic pain, going through chronic fatigue, all the other various aspects of, of a con your condition will understandably make you feel frustrated or stressed or fed up. That's utterly normal. But the idea that EDS and HSD is are in people's heads is inaccurate and incredibly unhelpful. Um, people must also might be told, you know, you're a difficult case, you're just too complicated. And there's something about that that's very, very dismissive. Um, and you've just got to get on with it, which again is so unhelpful. There are so many um, different sort of strategies and approaches and medical plans and physio plans that can help a person, even if they have to find that they have to live with some symptoms. But the idea that you've just get, get, got to get on with it, I think can feel really abandoning to um, people. And then thinking a bit about family and friends, um, I think this can be such a frustrating, confusing area um, for people with chronic health conditions. And they can often say that sometimes, you know, a family member or friend or someone at work, they'll seem to get it. But then the next time they see them, they obviously just haven't fully got it. So questions like, well, why are you not better yet? Even if the person has explained that it's a chronic health condition, it's something they have to live with. Um, you know, you had pain last time I saw you too, just not understanding the nature of some of these chronic symptoms. Um, people can also be dismissive, you know, oh, you know, just try this new vitamin that will help or, um, oh, I know I feel awful too. I've got a cold. And I know a lot of our patients say to us, you know, I think if they tried living in my body for a little while, they really would see things differently. And then a really big one that comes up and has a really very direct impact on people's health and energy levels and well-being are when others will push them not to pace. So they might have got it in the moment when they were when when they were told that, you know, actually, I do need to pace and this is what I need to do with my life. But then in the day to day stresses and hecticness and 
often other people can just seem to forget a person's health needs and just say oh you know can't, can't we just go there oh, i know you said you're tired but can you just do this um so this i find can be a really difficult area and one that if people are also feeling um ashamed about guilty about frustrated about themselves uncertain about um, the fact that they need to pace this can be quite a triggering type of situation and it can at times really lead people to do more than they know they should and then end up paying for it a few days later or the next day um, so this is one to really look out for or another one might be but it's inconvenient for us to do that differently um, to, to go to do it a way around that will help you manage your sy symptoms um, or to go to this place rather than that place so this is these are some of the common things that i hear obviously i'm sure everybody has other experiences and this is not talking about the good experiences we have here we're focused on the times when things are, are difficult um, with some ideas about trying to help a little bit with that And these are some of the feelings that um, people can experience after these kinds of conversations. So, you know, it can leave people feeling emotions very strongly on afterwards, which is very understandable. So people might feel dismissed, misunderstood and then confused. You know, is it in their head? Are they doing something wrong? Are they imagining this? Um, and that confusion is, I think, so unhelpful for somebody's um, self-esteem and how they see themselves. They can understandably feel quite uncared for and let down. And then I think particularly in conversations with health professionals, I think fear can be triggered. Actually, if this person doesn't get it, then who is going to help me? And what will that say about my future? So feeling anxious, scared, helpless, and also understandable frustration, anger, just feeling under pressure to somehow fix this themselves without being given any answers. So these are just some of the, the feelings people might have from negative conversations. Obviously, more helpful conversations would lead to someone feeling understood, thought about, um, in control, more certain, knowing, um, knowing some things they can do to help. And also very, very importantly, just generally supported and feeling like they have a team of people around them, health professionals, but also a wider team of people in their life who will be there for them throughout this uh, chronic condition. So there's been some really interesting um, research by Halverson Penwell and um, Claire Frank Camano, um, looking at actually having difficult medical encounters with professionals who don't understand EDS or HSD can lead to traumatization so some of the symptoms that you can get from ptsd might be um what some people end up feeling after these kind of conversations and it really depends like if you have hundreds or even thousands of these conversations or you know dozens and dozens obviously the traumatization can add up um, it's worth bearing in mind that unfortunately the length of time to be diagnosed with eds averages about um just over 10 years so if you think about all those conversations that people are having during that time, all of the appointments where, where they go to and they don't feel like there's an outcome or they're, or they're not understood, um, this is really, really growing on for an extended time, which increases the likelihood of um, there being psych a psychological impact of it. Um, so this research found that um, the impact on the patient included, they would understandably want to avoid specific clinicians Worryingly, they might also avoid medical care, which is really understandable psychologically, but has a clear impact on their, their medical condition. There were negative health outcomes associated with these kind of negative medical experiences. Um, and then not being able to disclose their diagnosis, um, which is such a big one because a lot of what we work with patients about is how to begin slowly to accept their diagnosis and all their feelings about it and to get to a place which i'll be talking about a bit later where they can develop the kind of mindset that is going to help them through the ups and downs negotiate the helplessness allow them to feel the feelings and distress when they need to feel them and allow them to view themselves in helpful compassionate fair ways um part of that journey is 
accepting your diagnosis. And if others around you are not and are making you feel ashamed for it, then it's an incredibly unhelpful experience. And the research team also um, identified some of the symptoms of clinician associated traumatization um, and the link between them and trauma PTSD symptoms. So the shame, the acute anxiety, the intrusive thoughts are just that kind of constant thought process that's going on or that might happen unpredictably when you're not expecting it, intrusive memories. And this one I think is so important for EDS is hypervigilance. Trauma naturally puts the brain into um, a constant protect mode where people are on edge or on guard for waiting for something bad to happen, for danger, you know, whether the, the, the bad thing is being criticized, whether it's about something bad happening with their health um, or an, an, a traumatic event happening again. And being hypervigilant involves constant low or high levels of adrenaline and cortisol stress hormones. So if you think about the impact of those on energy levels and on symptoms, um, which we all know over time, it will drain energy, um, stress impacts our health um, in many, many ways, and it certainly impacts fatigue and pain. And that's been well documented. So hypervigilance is um, unfortunately really a really negative thing um, for people who are going through chronic uh, fatigue and or pain. Um, An exacerbation of pain symptoms. So in the way I just mentioned in terms of some of the neurochemicals, but also just things like uh, if people are in pain or their symptoms are worse, they, um, you know, if they're, they're worried and about something and there's trauma going on, they might tense up their body, tensor muscles is going to lead to more pain. Um, you, just general stress and anxiety will worsen um, people's symptoms. You know, I think we know that across the board throughout health conditions and, and general well-being. So there are really, really important reasons for helping people to begin to overcome some of the difficult experiences they've had. And um, to look at how this has affected some of their beliefs about themselves, which I'm going to um, talk a bit more about over the next two slides. So the first thing for, um, you know, you've got an appointment coming up with a health professional who doesn't really understand HSD or, D or EDS, and you know that that's the case, or you're just not quite sure. I think it's really important for people to get in tune with what do they want from the consultation, moving the focus away from what might others think of them and what might the doctor think or the nurse or physio, whoever, but really focusing on their needs and what they want. You know, do they want to walk out of that appointment with a referral somewhere? Do they want to um, have had some of their key questions answered? Um, are there tests that they want to happen? Um, so really trying to get in touch with what you want, um, because I think when um, when people are in a situation where they feel quite helpless and where maybe health professionals make them feel helpless, it's even more important to, to know what you need and what is going to be your focus within that appointment. Um, so as part of this, it's really important to do some preparation beforehand in line with the, your goals for the consultation and to um, write yourself some just some bullet points, prompts. Probably I would say nothing too long because you have to be able to look at it quickly in the consultation. Um, so probably less is more, but just even like keywords to help you remember your questions. Um, and then if it's an, a consultation you're really quite nervous about or that you're really unsure about how to phrase things, sometimes people worry about upsetting or alienating their health team. Um, and I think there is definitely a way of um, preparing questions in an assertive way, to, to, to deliver in an assertive way. So you might want to role play with someone who you trust and who you feel gets it. Now, a big one to um, help with uh, getting you into a better place before the consultation is not ruminating or over preparing. And I'll talk through that a bit more. But the aim of it is, if we're feeling stressed in a in a situation, stress will make our brain work faster, but in a sort of unhelpful way, it will it will be harder to think of questions, to retain answers, um, to uh, to communicate ourselves assertively in the way we want to. So it is utterly normal to feel nervous about going into an appointment, one that's really important and vital to your health and future, but 
we know that there are some things that will turn up the volume on that stress and end up making the appointment less likely to be helpful for you or more of a difficult experience. So what we know from lots of room of research throughout psychology um, is rumination, which um, is Latin for chewing the cud, you know, a, a cow chewing the cud. And the idea is with rumination that we go over and over something that we don't actually have the answer to um, or we don't have any new answers to. And um, rumination is different to problem solving. Problem solving means we are trying to find solutions. We, it takes us forward. Unfortunately, rumination, which we all do at various times, rumination takes us in a circle, a stuck circle, and um, research shows increases our anxiety levels. So if you're finding yourself going around the same things again and again, you're probably ruminating. I would say interrupt the process, recognize it's happening, write down your solutions you know problem solving mode what are the things you're going to say or do or even what are the feelings going you know and thoughts going through your mind right now maybe just journal them um somehow try to empty them out of your brain or put them externally onto a piece of paper into a voice memo whatever you need to do telling somebody and then really try to step back from ruminating try to just focus your attention elsewhere um something you might enjoy, something that you know will distract you. And over-preparing, again, there's a balance. Having some preparation beforehand is, can be really helpful to make you feel more in control in the consultation. But actually over-preparing, patients can often say when they have done that, they can't see the wood for the trees, they lose track of what they're going to focus on. Um, so I think less is more. Having your clear, clear um, bullet points about your priorities and then stepping back, trying to do something to switch off after that. Now, the next point is also quite a big one. I referred earlier to um, thinking about the beliefs you might have developed for yourself, um, maybe in part from some of these negative experiences with others around your health. And um, I think it's important to tune in to what you might be saying to yourself, what self-talk is going on in your head. And if it's not that positive or very nice to yourself, is that the way you would talk to a friend with those kind of difficulties? So really starting to think about what do you believe about yourself and your health issues? And I can talk about that more in the, in the next slide as well, but trying to really be kind to yourself some people say it's too it feels too um, difficult to be kind sometimes. So I always say, how can you be fair to yourself? What's realistic and fair about the way you talk to yourself? You've got a health condition that is no fault of yours in any way, despite some people in your life making you feel like it is. So really tuning into your needs, what's fair, how to be compassionate if possible to yourself, what will help you, and um, maybe leaning on people who you can trust and who will help to empower you as well so that you can um, gain from that. And visualization, not everybody um, likes visualization. Some people love it. So these are just ideas that people can um, pick and choose from. And um, just having a think about, could you visualize some of these things? Could you visualize yourself in the appointment, um, clearly articulating what you want to say with, um, assertive body language? Um, could you visualize yourself leaving the room feeling empowered or having been given the referral you've asked for? Um, or maybe visualization would be a calm place that makes you feel safe that you might want to imagine when you're thinking about these things. So just just think whether any of these ideas might or might not be helpful to you. Um, you might want to have someone there who gets it to come with you to the consultation. It can be um, really useful both for support, but also for um, them to help you remember some of the things. Um, research shows that we often remember less than 20% of what is said to us in a health consultation um, because of the way we're, we're having to focus and because of the role of stress. So um, having someone else there for, for lots of ways can be really helpful and they or you want to, might want to make some brief notes. And I guess in the long term, it's about trying to really find professionals who you do trust and who listen to you. And that might, as the, the data on the length of time to diagnosis showed, that might take a very long time. But I would say don't give up because they are out there. And hopefully they'll, they'll be people you um, are listening to during this conference. But 
you do deserve a health team who understand you and who are there to support you. So just keep believing in that and keep looking for it if you haven't got it yet. Um, and then finally, you might just want to think about whether you have got any um, trauma related from some of these medical experiences, um, whether that's actual um, medical treatment or whether it's from consultations. Maybe have a think about some of the symptoms um, I mentioned of trauma, like hypervigilance, intrusive thoughts or memories, um, rumination, um, overthinking. These are just um, a few of the uh, common feelings people might have when there's trauma. And then thinking now about how you can have these conversations with people in your personal life. Now, um, having worked with people with, with a wide range of medical um, conditions over the years, I would say this first point is one that um, is useful across health conditions. And that's for a lot of people. Again, this is personal. You you pick what feels best for you. But for a lot of people, having a very short description that they consistently use with everybody to describe either their health condition or their health needs. You know, they might need to have more breaks at work. They might need um, to avoid sitting down for long periods of time or um, to sit in a different kind of chair or pace themselves. Um, these are all things you may need and that's fine. Um, and often it may require a bit of a description of your health condition. Um, and I think having something that just rolls off your tongue that is pre-prepared can be really, really helpful for people um, so that you're not on the spot when somebody asks you. Equally, there might be others you want to have a more involved, longer conversation with. Um, but I think having a backup um, brief description can be really helpful for reducing anxiety about talking about your health condition because lots of people understandably feel um, a bit nervous before going to an event or meeting new people knowing they might have to go through um, explaining things. Um, now this is something I referred to briefly in the previous slide is beginning to tune into your feelings um, in different situations. Notice if you're feeling particularly upset or easily upset or distressed or worried. And you know, this is a principle that we should all follow. Try to just notice what the triggers are um, and why you feel that, what was happening just before you started to feel upset. And within this, think about some of the appointments and also interactions with others in your life around health and just question whether this is also happening in a conversation you're having right now with somebody, which actually might not be negative. It might be a neutral um, or even positive conversation, but maybe because of some of the things you've gone through in the past, you might be assuming things about what the other person's thinking and that might lead you to feel quite upset or overwhelmed or frustrated or anxious in the conversation so just have a think about what you're feeling in a conversation if you're upset and think about what it's about is it about the impact of the past or is it about something that's going on right now with the other person and this is um the next one of the point i've made about beliefs is um something i would say that um, kind of encompasses everything really. I referred to earlier just briefly about you and your health condition. What is it you believe about your health? Um, do you believe that um, there are things that somehow uh, you are doing where you to blame in some way, you know, because the reason I say that is patients have told me that they can feel that because other people in their life make them feel that. Um, are you seeing yourself as less than other people for this reason? You know, are you, have you got beliefs that you should be able to do more despite having a health condition? These are all really, really common things that people with EDS and HSD can feel. Um, and I think again, it's it's what's well, recognizing some of those negative beliefs, knowing that they're around, knowing why they developed, and then thinking about what would be new, more helpful, and crucially fairer beliefs on yourself. You know, I often say to patients, it's about actually if you're going on a walk with some friends and they can walk further than you and you're you've got some beliefs there at the moment that are saying that you're um you're not good enough because you can't go that far and um are ultimately being quite negative towards yourself. Actually, I think there's something about developing beliefs which recognize the um, the amount of effort you are putting in every day compared to other people. For you, managing to do that length of time on a walk is maybe the same as 
having to wear weights while you're walking up a hill compared to other hikers without weights. You are always doing more and carrying more burden. And doesn't that need some acknowledgement? Wouldn't it be fair to yourself to actually notice your survival abilities, your determinations, despite all of this, your ability to cope despite going through these things? Actually, you know, and I know this is often easy to say and hard to feel, but actually there is so much that people with EDS and HSD are going through every day they're coping and often dealing with a lot more than other people in the rest of their life with who don't have health problems. So I think it's really trying to step back and think what would be fair to myself here and crucially what would be more helpful because different beliefs, more helpful beliefs will help us feel less anxious, less stressed, less hard in ourselves, less low in mood. And again, maybe get the help of those around you who really understand EDS and HSD. How do they see you? Um, and I think some of the words that start to come when people ask these questions are proud and um, having so much respect and an admiration that this person is coping with all of this. So really start to tune into the kind of mindset and beliefs you might want to develop. And I think the final point I would say is if other people are consistently not understanding, dismissing you, um, and it's a pattern, I would consider thinking about raising it. First of all, considering, is it worth raising it with this person? Are you invested enough in them too? Um, if it is, consider the outcome you want to get from it. What do you want them to understand? And knowing that if we go about things assertively, but without um, things becoming high levels of conflict, that actually if we can communicate assertively and calmly, the other person is perhaps more likely to hear it. But there are definitely those who, despite being explained, will continue um, not understanding or dismissing. And then I think it's about continuing to raise um, issues and to be assertive and persistent with this. Because again, you deserve that you're, for yourself, especially given everything you're going through. The last thing that people um, with EDS and HSD need are um, negative people around them constantly dismissing their symptoms or what they're going through. So that's the end of my um, talk. Thank you very much for listening. I would say that we're all different. So there might be different bits of that that apply to you and um, other ideas you might use. There might be particular other parts that resonate for other people. So um, just tune into what you need and um, think about how to uh, get what you want out of some of these conversations. Thanks very much.